the Honorable Rector and Vice Rector of Sanata Dharma University, the Honorable the Head and Vice Head of the Institution of the Institute for Research and Community Service of Sanata Dharma University, distinguished speakers and moderator, our honorable participants who join us here in Kaderman Room, and also all participants who join online via Zoom application and live streaming in YouTube. Welcome to webinar Sanata Dharma Sharing Amidst a Pandemic with the theme Coping with Coronavirus Through Language and Literature. Please kindly allow me to read the rules of the webinar. We need cooperation from the participants who join via Zoom. Please set your application into mute mode. Please disconnect your YouTube. During the question and answer session, the participants from Zoom application, please use raise hand menu if you have a question. The question can also be delivered in live chat through Zoom application and also YouTube. Please write your name, institution, city, province or country. Please indicate to which speakers the question is for. Please write the question clearly and shortly. Excellences, participants, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to read our agenda items. First, opening. The second is speaker's presentation. And the third question and answer session, and the last is closing. The event is opened by opening prayer and also opening speech from Vice Rector for Collaboration and Alumni Affairs of Sanata Dharma University. The webinar presentation will last for about 80 minutes from four speakers, namely Dr. Tatang Iskarna, Truly Almendo Pasaribu SSMA, Dr. Andes Antonius Herujianto, MA, PhD, Professor Dr. Dr. Ande Novita Devi, MS, MA Hons, PhD. After the presentation, question and answer session will follow. This webinar will end at 12 Indonesian Western Time or at 5 coordinated universal time. Honorable participants, we will begin our webinar today with an opening prayer. I will lead the prayer in a Catholic way. Participants are also welcome to pray in accordance with their faith or religions. In the name of the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, we thank you for the health, the new day, so we all can gather through online or offline to share knowledge, inspiration, and experience. Through this webinar, we ask for your blessing for each person who participate in this webinar, who are generous to share their knowledge and experience to inspire others. Your infinite blessing would mean the success of this seminar. We may be a living witnesses of your genuine love through the enactment of the knowledge we acquire through this activity. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in the name of the Father, and in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Excellences, participants, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to invite Mr. F.X. Oda Tedaena, MPD, ADD, to deliver the opening speech. So, uh, good morning. Everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, webinar series, Sanada Dharma Sharing uh, amidst a pandemic. 
Mick. So actually this um, webinar is a webinar series. So today we have number 11, but maybe this, this one is the, the only one in English. Previously we had <coughs> the uh, webinars in uh, Indonesian language. So we have different uh, faculties from theology to uh, faculty of technology, um, education, pharmacy, psychology, and so forth. So um, the presenters from different faculties has, uh, have contributed to giving some ideas related to uh, the pandemic. So today we are having uh, presenters, the four uh, presenters has been uh, mentioned before, uh, Dr. Tatang, Putroli, Pak Heru, Professor Novi, and also the moderator for uh, Bumita. And in the previous sessions, more or less the presenters, uh, they presented um, ideas how to deal with uh, the pandemic, how to cope with the uh, pandemic. People from technology, for example, people from, people from pharmacy. But then today, are the um, you know presenters from the area of humanities so the question or to be more exact is the um, literature because the topic today is coping with uh, coronavirus through language and literature so then the question is how literature will contribute to the uh, solutions or to the um, you know coping with um, COVID? That, that is the, the biggest question, I think. Um, this happens also to be the last, I think, the last of the uh, series. So there has been uh, 10 other talks. So when we ask that question, then what is the contribution of literature? Maybe it's a kind of uh, difficult. You know, people from the faculty of pharmacy, they are trying to maybe uh, develop certain kinds of uh, drugs, certain kinds of um, vaccine for, for the uh, COVID-19. But then we have to remember that literature is never meant to give solutions or to solve problems. But literature is more to give us inspirations. And because literature it's giving us inspirations, then we can find solutions. We can solve problems because of that um, inspiration. I think I myself is, is not a good reader. Um, you know, I, I don't read a lot, but when I like a literary work that inspired me, I will read that particular work over and over. If the book worn out, I'll buy the new one. So uh, among those very few, maybe less than five, maybe just three books that I like very much is uh, one that, that is related to uh, what, what I said before, inspiration. I think that the one that I like best is the Arabian Nights or One uh, 1001 Night. Uh, in Indonesian, it's called Seribu Satu Malam. I think in Arabic, it's Af Laila Wa Laila. So I think that is a beautiful work. Why? Because it gives us inspirations. It has been filmed in 2000, and, and the, the, the final part of the movie was the last battle between um, the uh, crown prince uh, Sassanan and his rebellious brother uh, Abrasild. At the end, Sassanan won the war because he was inspired by the stories in those 1001 nights that was told by um, his wife, Zehrasat. So the word like open sesame, you know, give him uh, inspiration. How uh, Alibaba defeated the 40 thieves, for example, give him inspiration to win the war. So I think um, that, that is uh, today's talk. So we hope that we'll get some inspirations from the literary work and we can solve problems from those inspiration. So again, thank you very much to all the speakers and the moderator, and let's enjoy the talk and get inspired. Thank you.
thank you to Mr. Oda for giving the opening speech as well as opening the webinar. Excellences, participants, ladies and gentlemen, now it is the time for us to discuss experiences through the presentation from the speakers. Ms. Christina Laksmita Anandari, EDM, will act as a moderator. Ms. Mita is a lecturer of English Education Study Program or Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris in Sanata Dharma University. Ms. Mita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Yuni. Good morning, everyone, to all of you who are here in this room with us, and to our viewers in YouTube or in Zoom, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening if you're from different time zones. I hope every one of us here and also in your respective places are healthy and well. My name is Laksmita and I will be your moderator for today. Um, today's session is very special because like what Pa Oda just mentioned earlier, it's going to be done in full English. And this is our 11th webinar and uh, the committee has been working very hard for the past maybe four or five months, yeah? And um, today is special again because since we are using English and we hope that we can reach out to other viewers from worldwide. And last but not least, it's a very special moment because it's full house. This is, I think, the only webinar session that has uh, four speakers. Yeah, so a lot of um, amazing speakers here. We have Dr. Tatang Iskarna and Ibu Truli Almendo Pasaribu MA, Bapak Dr. Heru Gianto and Professor Novita Dewi. I will um, introduce you to them um, later on. So um, they are here today with us because they want to share their views on how the new normal situation due to coronavirus can be analyzed through theories on language and theories on literature. Um, today's theme is uh, written as coping with coronavirus through language and literature. This topic is intriguing to discuss because uh, at this moment, all of us here in all levels are experiencing disruptions. Our concept of normal living suddenly changed. We are now in a position where we question the meaning of normal. How normal is normal? Uh, so we're experiencing disruptions in many aspects of our lives, our mindset, our lifestyles, and our values. Our speakers will pinpoint this problem or this situation, and they will analyze it from dis different perspectives. Sitting here in front with me are four amazing speakers. Um, Ibu Professor Novita Dewi is from Kajian Bahasa Inggris Universitas Sanata Dharma. It's a graduate program for English language studies. And Bapak Heru Gianto is a lecturer at the English Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University. Ibu Truli Almendo Pasaribu is also a lecturer at the English Language Education Study Program. And Bapak uh, Tatang Iskarna is a lecturer in the Department of Letters in Sanata Dharma. In the next 80 minutes, they will share their ideas, their concepts, and points of view on the dynamics or the disruptions within our society due to the coronavirus. And they will also share the lessons learned that we can obtain from the situation. Our webinar will be divided into two sessions. The first session will be uh, the presentations from all of the four presenters. And afterwards, we will have a Q&A session, which will be done around 15 minutes. In the Q&A sessions, um, we have this door prize, courtesy from Persetakan uh, Kanisius. We will have five books for five people who will be actively engaging in the question and answer session. So let me read the title. So the first book is Sembilan Jalan Meningkatkan Kinerja Karyawan, uh, written by Awan Sentosa. Uh, Copywriter is Dead by Budiman Hakim. And these three 
last books are very special because these are written by the English Language Education Study Program lecturers. Uh, it's Bu Yusefa Ariani Iswandari, Pak Thomas Wahyu Prabowo Mukti, and Bu Patri Patricia Angelina. And these books are reading Get to Basics, speaking Get to Basics, and writing Get to Basics. So hopefully you will be the lucky ones who will receive this door prize, yeah. All right, so let us now enter our first session. Um, we will start with Pak Tatang. So can you please show the, on the screen, Pak Tatang's biography? Thank you. All right, so Dr. Tatang Iskarna, he received his doctors in literature in 2017 from Gajah Mada University. His dissertation entitled, uh, is written on the interest of research on African literature, colonialism, and Christianity. He received his master's degree uh, in 2002, master's in humanity from University of Indonesia, and his thesis is uh, a research on African literature, feminism, and post-colonialism. He received his bachelor's degree from Gajah Mada University. So if you can see there, he's one of the prominent speakers here today, and we are going to be very lucky to hear a lot of his views related to literature and the pandemic situation. Here are some of the research interests. So he focuses his research on literature, uh, marginalized in literature, the black or color, the disabled, women, colonized, lower and poor. Uh, the last three journals, as you can see there are Complexitas Postcolonial Dalam Puisi, Nyanyian Lawino Karya Okat Pebitek. Did I say that right, Pak Tatang? Yes, okay. And the second one is in 2018, he wrote The Relation Between Christianity and Colonialism in Ngugi Wa Tiongos, The River Between. And in 2020, he wrote Alam Dalam Perspective Natives and New Settlers, Kajian Ekokritik Puisi, Monolog Bumi Terjarah, Dan We Are Going. All right. Today, in the next 20 minutes, Dr. Tatang Iskara will present his paper entitled Lessons from the Abnormal Living Amongst the Normal and the Ideology of Normality, a Critical Disability Study on Two Selected Disabled Poems. Pak Tata, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Bu Mita. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen who attends physically in this place, and also good morning, ladies and gentlemen, who attends through Zoom meeting. Uh, talking about how to cope with the pandemic through language and literature, I think we have to go back to the definition of literature. I think it's very interesting uh, questions proposed by the Vice Rector for uh, International Relation Affair. Uh, how can literature, how can language contribute to coping with this uh, coronavirus? Okay, uh, for about 15 minutes, I'm going to share what I have found, uh, how literature at least can give something like uh, inspiration, uh, something like enlightenment, or maybe it's kind of a useful perspective, another perspective, how to see this pandemic, how to see uh, we are as a people uh, faced with problems of this pandemic. And then I'm going to take two poems uh, of the disabled people. Uh, the title is uh, I'm New, I'm Odd, I'm Odd, I'm New, sorry, and then uh, I'm Disabled, uh, Not Stupid. Yeah, I'm going to share uh, my presentation. The technician, would you like to help me? 
to share my uh, presentations. Right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to show you some perspective how people view literature. Uh, some people say, uh, yeah, it's only a fiction, not truth. So it cannot be used as a, a reasonable data. Some people maybe uh, think that uh, this is only uh, imagination, uh, not reality. Or some says that uh, this is only for entertaining, but not enlarging knowledge. Or some people will say um, it only concerns feeling, not reasoning. That's why from this perspective, uh, some people are doubted whether or not literature can give something like uh, real contributions, real uh, solutions for life's problem. But I'd like to show you the definitions. Yeah, uh, We have to understand the definitions that I compile from uh, some experts of literature. Yeah. Uh, the first one is from Pickering and Hooper. Uh, literatures can be defined as a uniquely human activity born of desire to understand, express, and share experiences. So this is a kind of uh, what people want to show to other people, how to understand, how to express, how to share the life experience. And then the second definition is from Velak and Warren. It's a kind of creative product of an author's imagination taken from documents of fact, collection of real events, or happening in real life. So actually this is a fact that the authors see in, in, in their lives. Yeah. Or maybe uh, chronological events or happenings. Pope defined literature as an expression of all human experience. What they understand, what they feel about it, what they expect from it. And Marcus and Soler also emphasized uh, writing with what is voiced, what is expressed, and what is invented. I can uh, give something like uh, uh, diagrams, yeah. What is literature so that uh, it can be uh, useful uh, to give inspiration as the vice rector says, yeah. So ex actually this is human life. What, what does the author, uh, author do uh, with the human life, yeah? Human life, which is experienced, which is understood, which is felt, which is expected to be, and then which is invented. So the author invents something new there. And then it is voiced, it is shared to other people. But in what way? It is expressed in a certain language, style, genre, with, of course, imagination. And this is what we call literature. So actually, this is a kind of documents of a behavior, document of experience, document of what people understand about life, what people expected what kind of life to be. And it was voiced, shared, and expressed to other people. Yeah, and then uh, I'm going to relate uh, these definitions yeah, uh, 
us with the problems amidst the C-19 uh, pandemic. What is the problem of our society right now? What do the human beings face actually? How human beings adapt to new environment, new situation, new conditions. This is the first problem. And then the second is how human beings fit the new normality. And then how human beings face the shattering impact of the pandemic, economically, psychologically, physically, socially, technologically. And of course, I'm proud of this university that we have uh, the previous 10 webinar uh, have uh, given answer uh, to these problems. And also the other problem is how human beings live under the fear of a terrorizing circumstance. Yeah. That, that's the problem uh, in, in my perspective uh, in this uh, pandemic. Now, how can um, literature cope with this, this, this kind of problems? Yeah. Uh, yeah, revisiting close reading, of course, literature is about reading. The text to explore what the author express, share, voice about their life and how they experience it, feel about it, understand it, and expect from it. And of course, invent something from it. This is very important. Of viewing the text with critical perspective, investigating the ideology operating behind it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make it a simple, uh, uh, easy uh, way so that uh, um, most people understand. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, and I will make the literature of disable as the models. Uh, there is something like an uh, analogy between what happened uh, uh, what happened to disabled people and what happened to today's people that 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 uh, uh, have to face this kind of pandemic. The disabled live under a strange circumstance which does not fit them. The disabled have to struggle to adapt to different environment which is not friendly and not comfortable to them. The disabled, who are considered uh, abnormal, live amongst the able, the normal, and under the dominations of the ideology of normality. Let me give you the examples. The blind live amongst the visually healthy people. It's not easy thing to do. Yeah? The deaf live amongst uh, people with good audibility. The paralyzed live amongst people with fast mobility. And the autistic live amongst the mentally and socially healthy people. Yeah, this is uh, the analogy. Uh, I take uh, two poems. I'm old, I'm new. Uh, from Benjamin Zero. Uh, Zero is a boy with autism, but uh, he is able to create what he feels, what he expects, what he is uh, 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 fearful of, yeah. what, is, uh, what is he going to do with, with these problems. Yeah. Uh, and then I also uh, take I'm Disabled, Not Stupid by Jenny Linsell. Yeah. Uh, she is a paralyzed, so uh, uh, she has problem with the uh, mobility. Yeah. Uh, she has a problem with the facility in public. She has a problem with how people uh, view her. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, now. To explore the inspiration through this text, uh, I'm going to use what we call critical disability study, uh, whether it is uh, ideologically and also practically. Uh, how to read the text with critical disability study? <clears throat> uh, we are going to uncover the ideology of normality. 
what is the ideology of normality? This is kind of binary opposition or dichotomy between normal and pathological, able and disabled. Uh, disabled people uh, have problem to live in, in the situations and in this dichotomy. And then also revealing the hegemony of normality and see the marginal disability as pitiable and tragic people. That's what happens. And then practically, actually, uh, this is what we are going to do in class, yeah? what my class is, is doing, yeah? identifying the problems they face as the disabled under the domination of the able, investigating how they cope with the strange circumstance which does not fit them, and then also exploring how they reach the responsive attitude, appropriate adaptation, and creative innovation while living under the ideology of normality. Yeah, I hope that uh, we can uh, obtain from, from the poems. Yeah. And then uh, let me show you some perceptions on the disabled. The first one is uh, physically weak people needing medical or physical aids uh, as the object of medications not socialist subject expressing their own and original voice. Yeah. So it must be voiced. Uh, disabled can be viewed as the tragical and pitiful people, not as people socially constructed as the marginal, like certain people of marginalized race, class, or, or gender. So actually, uh, sometimes it's socially constructed. Uh, in fact, they are uh, tragically and pitiful people. And then uh, some facts or phenomenon uh, that still happens, but not all happens, but sometimes uh, uh, still happens. Uh, there's no function. Uh, they are considered not contribute something to a society. No access to social environment as a result of the social attitude or structure, not from physical or cognitive difference. And also oppressed and alienated helpless to change their conditions. And the operations of the disabled, the first one is it can be exploitations, mobilized to work uh, in a, some certain institutions. They have to work, they, have to, uh, they, they are paid uh, little yeah, and isolated in a, a certain place. Marginalizations, no access to public, yeah, some of them. Yeah. Dependence or under others' authority and then violence considered uh, sexual sterilizations because uh, they don't deserve to regenerate uh, uh, the next. Yeah. And then stigma, uh, this is kind of dichotomy between normal and not normal, able and not able. Yeah. This is the operations they, they have to face. Now, uh, I'd like to give some um, uh, yeah, quick analysis. Yeah, what happens to uh, Kiru's? Yeah, uh, what problems uh, uh, he is facing actually? The first one is having different mental conditions. He is considered to have different mental conditions. So he is other. He is different from us. He is weird. Yeah. And then. Uh, Zero also feels lonely, yeah, as expressed in the, in the poems. And being perceived uh, weird, strange, uh, odd, ane. Yeah. And then uh, he withdraws from the society. Yeah. And then being unwanted and abandoned. Yeah. And what can we learn here? Zero realize this, this, this kind of conditions yeah. and then the dominations of the normality. But uh, from the poem that, uh, that we read, I think uh, he perceives his weird as a strength. Yeah. He is different, but the different uh, sometimes uh, yeah, odd, but he finds that he is new, so uh, weird as a strength. Yeah. And then he 
does not uh, quit life, but struggle to fit in. And he sees uh, the bright future. This is uh, what I read, yeah. What about uh, Lenny Liesel here? The problems are almost the same, yeah. The perception of her weakness as a shame, as a curse, something that uh, people uh, avoid. Yeah. And she is stigmatized as defect in everything, although she is actually only paralyzed, but uh, she is uh, viewed as a holy defect. That's the problem. See. And most circumstances not, uh, uh, do not fit her, especially the mob mobility. And then differently treated sometimes from the point of view of the facility and always overlooked disabled. Yeah. How uh, Lenny Liesel cope with these uh, situations? How she is as abnormal, how she is as disabled, uh, fit to a new situation, strange conditions. Uh, she accepts the paralyzed conditions and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm disabled. And then also, uh, she still finds the ability. If she finds disability in one element, in one part of his life, she still finds ability in another part of uh, her life. That is brain. Yeah. Uh, for her, disability is not a problem in some other way, but she does something useful with her other different ability. So this is uh, uh, my reading on the poems. Yeah. And now lessons, yeah, actually uh, this is uh, the key, uh, how to cope with the pandemic uh, through literature, through the reading uh, with uh, critical disability studies. Yeah. Problems are in their way. Of course, yeah. But responsive attitude must be decided to choose. So uh, we have problems. Uh, we have uh, to face a situation which is different from the previous conditions. It's hard to do. Uh, we have to teach using LMS. It's a hard thing to do. We have to avoid the crowd as a social people. It's a hard thing to do. We are not allowed to hug the people we love. It's a hard thing to do. We are not allowed to get together, to have lunch or supper, dinner together. It's, it's hard to do. But responsive attitude must be decided to just, yeah. We have to go on this life. The second one, the circumstances do not fit them. Quick adaptation needs to be conducted. We have to wear masks, washing our hands often, and then avoid the crowd, social distancing. Yeah, we have to uh, fit this kind of conditions. And then there are nothing to do for the disabled, but creative innovation must be constructed. Like uh, Juro, Benjamin Juro, and also Lenny Lizards. Yeah. All right, uh, so the disabled and the critical disability study means that uh, disabled people have unique voice and complex experience. Yeah. We have to change uh, our perceptions here. And they should be seen as a human variant. It's a kind of uh, yeah, different, uh, uh, that's why some people might say defable, differently able, yeah. as a human variant. Yeah. But Tatang, uh, sorry, yeah. you have two more minutes. Thank right. you. Okay, this is the last.
being socially constructed phenomenon and being able to do other things and having right to determine themselves. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bumita. Okay, thank you, Pak Tatang. Let's give a big applause for Pak Tatang. All right, so um, once again, Pak Tatang has highlighted how literature can be a representation of human life. And it's a document that portrays the reality of human life. It all goes back to the opposite poles of human thoughts, right? So it's about normal versus abnormal, good versus bad, able versus not able. So, and Pak Tatang has emphasized that the dynamics that happen in between these two poles are actually uh, how we cope with the situation and can determine how we live our lives. So once again, thank you Pak Tatang for the insightful presentation. Now let's move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, while Butruli is preparing her PowerPoint, I would like to remind all of you, particularly if you are in the Zoom, um, if you have a question, you can use the raise hand icon or you can write down your question in the Zoom chat uh, comment uh, form. Please write down your name. Um, the complete name, your affiliation, your location, and to whom the question is referred to. This also goes well for our viewers who are watching us from YouTube. Don't forget to write down your location, your affiliation, and the question. We will do our best to answer the questions later in the Q&A session. All right, Mutruli, are you ready? Yes, okay, so um, operator, can you show us Butruli's um, profile, thank you. So Ibu Truli Almendo Pasaribu, SSMA, is a graduate from uh, letters, English Letters Universitas Negeri Malang, and she obtained her bachelor's degree there, and her master's degree from Gajah Mada University. And she has been teaching in Sanata Dharma in the English Language Education Study Program since 2013. Her research interests are mainly about discourse and semantic analysis and technology for language learning. So she has written some of articles, uh, scientific articles related to those research interests. Among others are appraisal framework in analyzing learners' attitudinal resources on performing of mice and men. And that was written in 2020. And the next one is in 2019, she wrote Meta Discourse Markers and Gender Variation in Journal Articles. This was published in SCSI Journal. So it's um, Q, Sinta, or Q? Q3. Q3, okay, in Q3 level. And uh, the next one is in 2017, she wrote Gender Differences and the Use of Meta Discourse Markers in Writing Essays. And she also has research interest in technology and language learning. So she wrote some books related to these two research interests. The first one is um, Technology for English Language Learning. This is, sorry, this is actually the article. And um, also challenging EFL students to read digital reader response tasks to foster learner autonomy. So, she has written a lot of uh, scientific articles throughout the, th the years. All right, so without further ado, uh, Butruli, you have 20 minutes to share your view entitled Learners' Voices in Online Learning Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic Through Appraisal Analysis. Butruli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bumita. Good morning, Romo. Ibu Bapak, everyone in YouTube and Zoom. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share at Sanata Dharma Berbagi. This morning, I'm going to talk about our research, learners' voices in online learning amid COVID-19 through appraisal analysis, which was conducted together with Professor Novita Dewi. So, we think it is timely to investigate the topic, this topic because COVID-19 pandemic has affected various aspects of life 
including the coping mechanism of our university. Pak Tatang mentioned that we have to change from normal to new normal. COVID-19 pandemic indeed has abruptly altered the learning mode from face-to-face -face learning through to online learning. Accordingly, we have to adjust our learning style and learning process following the government's call for social distancing. The COVID-19 pandemic, on the other hand, has accelerated the development and also implementations of technology in learning. Studies have documented the benefits of technology in learning. Before the pandemic, we have used these apps. My colleagues and I have documented how these digital tools help improve learners' performance. These tools give benefits including reducing anxiety, fostering autonomy, and promoting engagement. But the situation now is different. We have to alter the first three types of courses to the last one. Before the pandemic, I used technology to enhance my classes, but now I have to use full online instructions. And it may affect not only me or other teachers, but also our learners. It might affect learners' attitude towards courses during this exceptional upheaval. Why? Because online learning requires much, not only from the teachers, but also from the students. Therefore, it is important that we hear students' critical voice during this pandemic to evaluate or make reassessment on online learning during the time of crisis. And one way to do that, one way to get in-depth insights is through scrutinizing or investigating students' reflective writing. Why reflective writing? Writing reflections is a meaningful way to get a deeper understanding of one's learning experience. Sizable literature has documented the benefits of reflections. Like Buella and friends mentioned that writing reflection is an attempt to understand more deeply what has been learned. I think Bumita also has written about how reflection helps students to be more confident. Pak Kus adds that reflections are crucial for students to exercise cognitive process and assess learning experience. Barton and friends also mention some benefits of writing reflection, including documentation, reality, analysis, self or collaborative study, and professional resource. The benefits of such activity may be greater in time of crisis. That's why it is vital to document and scrutinize students' reflective writing systematically to see to what extent we can cope with the situation. Okay, so how do we analyze students' reflections? We use appraisal analysis. Sizable literature has proposed that appraisal framework is a powerful linguistic framework to investigate both spoken and written discourse. It has helped researchers to scrutinize complex ideas and voices. With this framework, we can capture linguistic evidence highlighting students' personal choice. And appraisal itself can be broken down into three categories, attitude, engagement, graduation. And in this study, we focus on attitude, which consists of effect, judgment, and appreciation. Effect deals with the um, emotions and feelings. Judgment concerns with evaluations of behavior, while 
appreciation deals with assessment of aesthetic. So we use this framework to answer our research question. What attitudinal resources were found in learners' reflection amid COVID-19? To answer this question, we follow some systematic procedures. We use qualitative content analysis method because we conducted a close reading of textual matters. We got the data from 20 reflections written by English language education students from batch 2017 and 2019 in May 2020. And from the reflections which voice out the students' opinions and feeling, we found 261 expressions containing attitudinal resources. And these expressions were carefully coded into subcategories using the appraisal framework. Now let's take a look at the findings. So uh, the pie chart here shows that the students use all attitudinal resources. The highest one was effect, 40%, followed by appreciation, 32%, and judgment, 28%. The pie chart shows that student consider online learning as something emotional and personal. The high use of effect markers shows that they consider this activity as something personal with them. Let's take a look at each category. The first one is effect category, which can be broken down into four other subcategories. The student's reflection show conflicting emotions as they use both positive and negative subcategories of effect. We can see that the students use positive inclinations because they want to show a strong desire to go back to normal life, to go back to normal class and, social, and have social interactions with their friends again. So let's take a look at the sentences that they have in their reflections. The examples here show that the students use metaphors like dying and empty to show their feelings. Some others also use words with denotative meaning yeah, in expressing their feelings. And from the data, we can see that they express positive inclination towards these items. They have a strong desire towards these items including regular class, friends, being able to manage time, and so on. We can also see unhappiness or negative happiness in their reflections because they were unhappy uh, towards the change. They feel lonely. They were not comfortable with the massive assignment. They have to adjust to online class. Some face mental breakdown. While others might be happy, some also express positive happiness or happiness. Some can enjoy online learning. They enjoy privacy, family bond, and they, they appreciate the skills that they gained during the pandemic. Well, the reflections also show some dissatisfaction towards the change. Perhaps because their expectations at the beginning of the semester before the pandemic were not met. So they were not satisfied with the lockdown regulations and also boring activities at home, yeah, and some assignments, yeah. All right, the next category is judgment category, which deals with evaluations of behavior. The high use of positive capacity here shows that the students were able to self-evaluate the progress, self 
evaluate the skills that they have gained during the pandemic. We can see an example here in sentence number 10. So I realized my improvement, I became more creative. So uh, they evaluate, they reflect that they were able to be creative during the pandemic. And they express positive capacity towards several items here, like enhancement, online communication, autonomy. They, they were able to work in team. Yeah. They were able to develop their creativity at home. And the last one is appreciation category. We can see that the dominant one is negative complex composition, which means that the students face some challenges and also difficulties when during this pandemic. However, in facing the obstacles, the student also show positive evaluation, which means that they were able to focus on the value of learning. Let's take a look at the examples in sentences. So we can see that they face a lot of difficulties yeah, in online learning, but they also mention that it is worth it. So the complex compositions are, exp are expressed towards these things, yeah? online learning, financial problem, poor internet connection, materials, so these items put students in a difficult situation. However, they can also focus on positive valuations, on how the experience helped them improve. Yeah, they experience enhancement, they, they experience personal growth, as in here, and also empathy towards the lecturer. Okay. While analyzing the reflections, some big themes emerge. The first one is autonomy. Research mentioned that autonomy is the ability to take charge of one's own learning. So students were able to be responsible for their own learning. And we can see the high use of positive capacity shows that students can improve without face-to-face -face or direct uh, supervisions from the teacher. We can see that the students were able to manage their time, as in, in excerpt 24. They were able to execute the plan together with friends, as seen in excerpt 25. And they were able to reflect on their journey on being independent. The next one is that students, learners, feel the importance, realize the importance of social engagement. Dilahanti mentions that social engagement refer to positive relationships among tutors, peers, administrators. So the students have strong desire to go back to campus. The students miss the class as well as their teachers as well as uh, interactions with friends. It can be seen from excerpt or example 27 and 28. Well, technology does not only help students to, uh, to improve their ability, but also to interact with friends. We can see from excerpt 29 to 31 that the students can use technology to interact with friends. When they, feel, when they face difficulties in doing the massive task, as what they said, they interacted with their friends using technology. Okay. And they also develop digital compassions. They realize that they are not in the difficult situation alone. No one planned for this, but here we are. Right. So they, um, they interact not only with their friends, they have compassion not only uh, towards their friends, 
by helping them, but also they show their compassion towards the lecturer by appreciating the lecturer's efforts and struggles in adjusting from face-to-face -to, -face to online classes, as can be seen in these sentences. Okay, not only with friends and lecturers, but the students also also ex experience closer family bond during this pandemic. Some research suggests that COVID-19 has negatively affect families, more divorce rate, and more violence, domestic violence, while some other research suggests that COVID-19 pandemic actually provide opportunity for more parents-children interactions. Fortunately, the data in the reflections agree with the second one, so that so the students feel closer with their family during online learning. Why? Because online learning offer flexibility which enabled them to manage time for learning and for family. Right. Literally, you have two yeah. more minutes. All right. Thank you. And there are some challenges emerge yeah, in their reflections. Two of them are mis of miscommunication and lack of communication, and also massive assignments. So Dilahanti mentioned that uh, lack of communication can hinder engagement. Well, adjusting from face-to-face -face communication to online communication takes time and process. And our university takes some actions. Actions were taken. We provide space for students to express their feelings and voice. We provide nine digital workshop series for teachers and for staffs. We also conducted several research on COVID-19 pandemic to improve our teaching and to improve learners' performance. So I am optimistic that we're going to be more prepared in online learning. So although the study should be viewed within its limitation, we can see that a linguistic framework provide useful and analytical tool to analyze students' voice. The dominant use of effect markers shows that online learning has given students deeply personal and meaningful experience. Through judgment resources, we can also see how the students were able to self-evaluate their development. And through appreciation resources, we can see that although students face challenges and difficulties, they could deal with the obstacles by focusing on the value of learning. So, as educators, by hearing students' voice, we can be more aware of the delicate circumstances during this upheaval. And by acknowledging their voice, we, can, we could maximize the potential of online learning. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a big applause to Ibu Truli. So Ibu Truli has uh, mentioned earlier that our lives as educators have changed drastically, but not only us, but also our students, right? We are facing different um, challenges here and there. For us educators, we are usually um, accustomed with face-to-face -face learning, and then suddenly it's changed into social distancing, and we have to make use of the online learning uh, or the learning management system uh, in the maximum way that we can uh, do. And the students, they are also uh, experiencing challenges because they are suddenly um, in the position where they cannot do anything else in a group they have to be in their individual places and they cannot communicate, they cannot converse with each other because of the social distancing. And from the appraisal framework, according to Butruli, um, it can help us educators to really understand how 
uh, the students are trying to cope. So we should never say that they are not doing anything else. They are just complaining and complaining. They are not complaining. They are trying to comprehend what's going on with their uh, new situation, just like we are doing right now. So once again, thank you, Butruli, for the insightful uh, presentation. All right. Once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching us from Zoom, uh, don't forget to write down your affiliation, your location, and your uh, question, and to whom the question is referred to. And if you're watching us from YouTube, uh, welcome. And if you have questions, again, write it down in the comment box, write down your affiliation and your location, and the question, of course, and to whom the question is referred to. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving on to the third speaker, uh, Pak Heru. So could you please show us the profile? All right. So Pak Heru is uh, one of the seniors in the English Language Education Study Program. He was my lecturer when I was doing my undergrad in Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris. So uh, it's an honor for me to be here moderating Pak Heru today. And he has been teaching at the English Language Education Study Program since 1987. And he received his master's degree in literature, in English in particular, from Ateneo de Manila in the Philippines uh, in 1998. And he received his PhD in literature from De La Salle University in Manila in 2000. His work experiences are quite vast. Um, he was the head of the study program in the English language education study program from 2002 until 2005. And he initiated the uh, MMC class, so mass media communication class, which is offered in our study program. Um, his works focus on action research, English language teaching, criticism of Indonesian literary works, journalism, and research on Japanese culture. He's the initiator and founder of Katrasnazism theory, and he's also, um, he had also been working as a correspondent for the BBC in UK from 2001 until 2019. His main research interests are basically related to literature, and his recent books are entitled Understanding Indonesian Plays, Wayang and Brechtian Strategy, which was published in 2016, and Membangun Budaya Baca Melalui Membaca Pemahaman, or Establishing Reading Habit by Implementing Comprehensive Reading, which was published in 2017. Today, Dr. Heru Gianto will share his views entitled Like the Bottomless Well, Indonesian indigenous literary works Manunggaling Kawulo COVID-19 pandemic. But Heru, you have 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Bumita, uh, Pak Heri from LPPN, and also the management of Sanata Dharma University. Uh, in this very occasion, I would also like to say hello to everyone uh, with us here in the seminar. Hello, Hope. It's from Hong Kong. Okay, thanks for watching. And I'm Lulu from Manila. Robert from Nice, France. Comment ça va? Ça va bien? Surabaya, ada Matthews. Hi. And so many people there in Surabaya. Of course, from Surakarta, Salatiga, Pakwit, and everyone. I thank you so much yeah, for being with us here. Yeah, I cannot, uh, sorry, I cannot mention uh, you all one by one. Right, okay, uh, to make a half ado, I would like to, okay, share the screen first. Okay, hopefully there won't be any problem. Okay, let me see. Okay, here. I should put this one here. Okay. And then, let me see. Okay, very good. Oh. 
Okay, <laughs> disappearing there. Uh, okay, why is why is it like that? <laughs> okay, uh, maybe should I cross it again? Okay, I tried once again. Okay, so uh, okay, okay, maybe I'll take this the other one. Yeah, huh? Which one? This one. Okay, and then share. Okay, then pick right away. Oh, I should wait for a while. Hmm? Oh. No, no, I don't, I don't mean that. Okay, that's just in the wrong file, yeah. Okay, I will start with share. Okay, maybe in this one. Okay. The one, then the one. Right. Then. Okay. Okay. Right, okay. Uh, okay, as it is, it is uh, written there. Okay, the title of my uh, presentation is Like the Bottomless Well, Indonesian Indigenous Literary Works, or I would mention a little bit on brain tags, Manunggaling Kaulo Lan Gusti and COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I would not okay mention about the victims of this uh, convicts, okay. But I would like to mention that this uh, presentation, yeah, this presentation is uh, about the wrapping up of uh, six minor research projects, okay. To begin with, uh, I would like to talk about uh, brain tags. Okay. Uh, it argues that literature is a unique expression of ethic and morality within a certain historical period. And that literature is not just an art of language, but rather an art of tags. Okay, so this way our focus will be dealing with ethical literary criticism which uh, reads, interprets, analyzes literature from ethical perspective. Okay, and then the second point, in light of ethical literary criticism, then the so-called moral enlightenment, okay, it reminds us of righteous words, okay, saying Dulce et Utila, okay, it is similar, yeah, but totem unlikely, okay, in, in, in Yogyakarta we have the expression member ning dudu, right, okay, and then the second one is uh, literature's primary function, okay, so not only moral enlightenment, but also uh, its function, okay? In the meantime, while aesthetic appreciation is merely second to it, okay? Right, okay. Uh, uh, okay, uh, the next one, I would like to give an example of the brain tags. Sacrificial offering for such a great love of yours, kindly 
save my ups and downs those complicated ones upon me to accord words you will upon us be done and be granted with enlightening right days. that's only an example yeah from uh, gusti ulon okay and this is a, a temptation how to translate it okay from the original one in order to understand it and to be understood by people okay uh, of other uh, language speakers okay i'll just give you one line it is said that gusti ulon ulon chos pisung all right and then it is okay only an example can be translated to oh my lord this sacrificial offering etc and so on okay so the point is that we are transforming okay the meaning okay so not only transforming the words okay that is called brain text so we are dealing with the text okay in the text okay and the text is a text okay every text is equal okay and that's the point right okay uh, the next one okay uh, based on the bottomless well the bottom bottomless wells is a play uh, written by Arifen Senors talking about a person conflict yeah it is a never ending song of conflict uh, experienced by uh, Jumano okay in the play Jumano is the director of the play itself so in fact it is uh, why the title is the bottomless well okay so we are here uh, triggered by the play to see the so-called the nature of uh, the pandemic it is like the bottomless well because we know very well that the so-called virus there is no remedy for virus no not at all okay what we can do is only to make us becoming immune to such a virus okay like uh, tuberculosis like uh, fever and now oh, COVID-19 okay so this is the role of literary works to remind us to remind us okay that such virus is not attacking us but because we are weak okay from the works are produced in uh, Gaguritan, okay in in the so-called uh, what do you call it uh, mochopat okay one of them is dandanggulo okay and, and also in the uh, tra traditional local theater katopra okay all okay all of those work okay are trying to, to depict reminding us okay that everything is ourself okay it is based on the principle of the sukulman nunggaling kawulolan gusti okay because it is uh, okay like uh, that everything is a hono choroko and ending up with mogobotongo okay we begin from nothing and of course it will last nothing okay so it is a different version of the so-called alpha omega okay the beginning and the end mandung manung geleng kalau is the unity of the okay okay the the the, the creator and human being so it the it means that it is the end yeah the end of our of, of life so the so-called indigenous literary works are trying to remind us that everyone has one purpose in life uh, explicitly or implicit implicitly saying that they want to be achieving the so-called manunggaling kawulolan gusti all right that's why there is a saying 
Oke, okay. urip mono mong mampir ngombe. It mean that life is just a short period of time. Oke, okay. oke. Okay. As long as when you take a when we sip, oke, okay, uh, 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 oke, okay, tea for example. So it is indeed very short time. Oke, okay. and then not only those literary works talk about the so-called guidelines, but they also provide how to achieve that. Okay. Um, in in Jogja culture or rather Japanese honochoroko, then the solution is just read it the the other way around. Okay. Instead of saying hono choroko, then the remedy can be read the other way around. Yeah, koroco noho. It means that in life you need to have a plan. You need to prepare yourself. Okay, uh, if you don't want to be infected from the virus, you need to plan something. And what have been done by the world at the, uh, at the moment actually is already appropriately done, okay? With your mask, yeah, with your mask, uh, your mask, and then okay, keep uh, okay, uh, uh, distance, and of course keep clean. That is a plan, okay? Right. Um, I have okay. I have this the so-called gekuritan. In fact, it is dandang gulo. Okay, the name of it is uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Pangkor pelok patot enam, or I would like to say tiah pengajeng. Yeah, tiah pengajeng. Actually, uh, it is originally meant to say tias dalam, all right? But it's too high, so they are just uh, tiah pengajeng. That everyone okay has a dream. That everyone has a hope. Without having dream, okay, they say that you die, right? Okay. For example, uh, let's go very quickly. I will uh, mention some several lines. Okay, this is dandang gula. Yeah. For example, number one, ikhlas mono deder sekarjati. Okay, this is at the same time is trying to see how Asian people is not exactly the same the way they see life, okay, uh, as they do in Western world. I'll give you one uh, example, right? Okay, we Indonesian people when in the morning we see each other, we will say selamat. Selamat pagi. Okay, while people from England, okay, they say good morning. Okay, to Indonesian people, the most important thing is selamat, to feel safe. Okay, while in English they say good, they don't say safe morning, but they say good morning. So this is already two different point of view. That is exactly when we are trying to understand different language, in this case English, for example. We need to consider the cultural aspects, right? There are so many examples. Okay, for example, in Tiak uh, Pengajeng, okay, there are only talking about five things, okay? Cipto, Karso, Roso, okay? And then your true being, okay, okay. It it, it is uh, in this in this song. I cannot just translate chapter karso rasa into English. No, but I try to change it into English or Western way culturally saying about life. Okay. Then of course then I translate uh, chapter karso rasa and pancer. Okay, as, as Wayang mentioned about it, into things that they should not do. Okay, yeah. Okay, what what should they uh, the thing that they should uh, avoid to do? Okay, number one, pride. Yeah, as a noun. Okay, you cannot say that you are the most important person. Okay, okay, uh, and then. 
last. Okay, that's supposed to be avoided. The next one is uh, as uh, here gluttony. You 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 cannot indulge yourself. You should in, uh, avoid indulging yourself. Okay, and then the other one is sloth and wrath or anger. You see? Okay, in the West, in English, you use sex not supposed to do while, okay, in Asia, in this case in Java, what you should do. Not should not do, but what you should do, what you should follow. Cepto, Karso, Rosso, and Pancer. Okay, which is in Wayang, we can say Semar, Petro, Gareng, Bagong, and Arjuna. Okay, that's in Wayang point of view. Right, okay, so, okay. Another work is Ketopra. Ketopra, the same thing, okay. Those belief, those idea are depicted by acting it out. Yeah, and they are performing it on stage. Okay, but the mission the same, that you are supposed to achieve manunggiling kaula gusti. Meaning, if you are becoming uh, written to God, it means you are supposed to do good thing. Okay, and that's one of the interpretation of manunggaling gusti. Okay, um, in English there is also a saying, okay, um, okay, hopefully that uh, what in, on earth is also as the same as what it happened in heaven. <laughs> okay, that's the same saying, manunggaling kaulo lan gusti. Right, okay. Uh, the other example is Macapat and uh, Macapat and Dandanggulo. Yeah, Macapat and Dandanggulo. In Macapat, okay, there are okay uh, eleven, yeah, eleven genre. Okay, uh, Maskumambang, Mijil, Sinom, okay, Kinanti, Asmorondono, Gambo, uh, Dandanggulo, Durmo. Yeah, Pangkor, Megatroh, and Pochong. Each genre is representing every stage of life. Okay, okay. When we are talking about maskumambang, it is dealing with when we are a fetus, yeah, embryo. Okay, Mijil, yeah, we are, we are being born. Sinom, when you okay during youth. Kinanti, okay, Kinanti, okay. You need guidance, okay. And then Asmarondono, okay, so when you are on the set of, okay, fire of love, gambo, okay, so you find your, your partner, okay, partner not necessarily another human being, but your passion, okay, okay. And then Megatroh, yeah, Megatroh means Megatroh, so it means when your soul, okay, this is when you are dying. Okay, and then pochong. Okay, usually when you die, you will be, okay, wrap up, <laughs> okay, uh, with the so-called kafan, yeah, uh, pochong. That's it. All right. So I can I cannot talk much because of, uh, okay, okay, but I need to mention a little bit about dandanggulo. Okay, Dandanggulo is a one of literary work men or can be used as to counter in the sense of to face COVID. Okay, of course it is more spiritually, which is supposed to be followed by action. Okay. So the indigenous work here is not only exposing, reminding us about the guidance, okay, that we need to know by, by heart, okay, but you need to the so-called laku, okay, okay. So okay, we believe that uh, action is louder than words, okay. That's why you may talk about anything, but if you don't act it out, if you don't implement laku, it's nothing. Okay, so once again, the literary work here, okay, one of the functions is to remind us, okay, providing us with some guidelines. 
All right. Okay. Uh, okay. That's the. Okay. Back to there. Okay. Okay. Before okay completing this uh, discussion. Okay. Let's see. Looking into Guritan, Sastra Mantram, and Dandang Gula with their vibrating manunggaling kaulolan gusti using an eclectic approach, such as uh, brain text or ethical literary criticism. Sorry, Pai Hu, then two more minutes. Okay. Using Katasunanism and Wayang Christian strategy, okay? Then we can conclude that looking into it, examining this work, okay, we see that this work is to modify in the saying, verba valen scripta manen. Into verba et scripta manen. This Latin words, okay, saying that the verbal expression which is artistically constructed and the written one, they are indeed meant to last. Okay? Then number two, to suggest that the works are strongly deserved to be used as one of the material in BIPA class. Yeah, okay. So make use this one, okay, so teaching uh, in Bahasa Indonesia to, okay, speaker of other languages, supposed to use a uh, cultural approach. Okay, one minute to close this uh, presentation. Have this is the theme of Katrasinanism, yeah, talking about Cipto Karso, okay, yeah, and Rosso. And then in English it is translated into the six uh, deathly sins. Okay, uh, let me see. Dan menggulo dia pengajeng dining Ki Anton Herujianto. Iklas mono dadar sakar jati terima pasrah cerdambe suarko mana tansa. Luper sahwe Kya soong pamprih tuhu Kasu metepi ajre sami Sumarap soan cipto Perso karso Bungu Kantin junjung Uri karso Ten ngasto jah Cawis Margi kanjeng Gusti Luruheng Katur Rahoso Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Heru. Let's give once a more big applause to Pak Heru. All right, so uh, Japanese culture is basically a very rich culture, and it can be used to analyze the current situation. This shows that language, literature, and culture are the true representations of human lives. I believe that if we analyze this current condition with other cultures, we would understand better of what's going on actually uh, in around our society and we can be more empathetic to one another. So once again, thank you, Pak Heru, for the wonderful presentation. All right, now we move on to our last speaker for the day, the gong for the presentation. Um, let us see Ibu Novita Dewi's uh, profile in our screen. Thank you. So Professor Dr. Randa Novita Dewi, MSMA Hans, PhD, um, has been teaching here at the, at, 
our university since 1990. She received her bachelor's degree from Ikip Sanata Dharma in 1986. Her master's degree, the first master's degree, is from Pangajian America UGM in 1990. And her second master's degree is from School of English in University of New South Wales in 1998. And she received her doctor's degree from NUS, National University of Singapore, in 2005, and focusing on Southeast Asian Studies program. And she is a newly minted professor, so she is now a professor in literature since March 2020, so congratulations, Professor Novita Dewi. Um, she has been uh, working a lot, of course, in terms of writing scientific articles. And these are some of her articles uh, for the past two years. Um, the first one is Ikyo Humanism in Teaching Poetry of EFL Students in Indonesia. This was published in 2018. Uh, Cognition, Conscience, and Creativity. Multimedia-based literature teaching for pre-service teachers in Indonesia. This was published in 2019. River, Resistance, and Women's Resilience in Indonesian, Malaysian, and Vietnamese fictions, which was published in 2020. And she also co-wrote uh, one article with Dalan Mehuli Peranginangin with the title of Landscapes and Animals, an Ecosophical Analysis of Pagu Folk Tales. Professor Novita Dewi will share her presentation entitled Literature in Pandemic Times, Contagion and Compassion. Professor, you have 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Okay, okay. Uh, good, morning, uh, good morning everyone, morning, everyone. joining everyone. from joining different, from time, different zones. time zones. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, become the last speaker of the day. Being the last speaker, no further statement is necessary on the ways in which illness or pandemic and their psychosocial impacts are represented in literature. All the speakers have uh, talked about that very nicely and very clearly. The, back, the fact that both can piece together literature and pandemic is now very clear. I shall therefore proceed to the connection between virus and fear, that's the uh, second uh, uh, topic. And um, next, be, becoming uh, uh, vir uh, viral isn't, isn't, isn't really bad because nowadays, uh, to be viral in the internet is everyone, uh, every blogger's dream. So uh, we can see uh, the, the constructively that uh, virus isn't necessarily that, that, that bad. So we will see in literature. Uh, I shall explore how virus and fear are uh, inextricably linked. Then I'll talk about an option. We choose fiction or faction. And then I shall conclude with empathy shown through fiction that may become a solution. Thank you. When asked how, if any, can literature prevent the spread of COVID-19, I always say, well, I, I'm, I'm lucky because the answer, I have no answer to that. The COVID-19 pandemic has inflicted havoc throughout the world. Victims and mortality rates steadily increased in January 2020. All aspects of life have been all shattered by the virus that spread more quickly than anyone expected or predicted. 
reading fiction, that is my answer, can be one way to reflect on the worst case scenarios often portrayed in literature. Literature portrayal is often resonant, is often related to the present day situation like the spread of the coronavirus. As we remember, and uh, uh, Dr. Tatang and Dr. Harujianto have mentioned earlier on that literature is the essence of people's contemplation on life. So success, failure, love, hate, peace, war, forgiveness, you name it, all events sometimes, and many more are uncovered imaginatively and creatively in literature. Literature is of course rich, just as joy and triumph are a subject of literary work, so havoc, uh, uh, discomfort become uh, uh, the core of such great works. I can uh, show you there are three major or masterpieces that talk about disease, the plague by uh, Albert Camus, Daniel DeVos' Journal of the Plague Year, or uh, Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez' Love in Time of Cholera. To name only three, we are not going to discuss these exemplary masterpieces. Uh, I will discuss the less heavy one within the remaining uh, time of today's seminar because I, I, I've noticed that uh, many of you have been uh, very tired all day long. So uh, the presentation, uh, the vice rector said the presentation took like five months preparation, so by this time, uh, you must be very tired, so I shall deal with something very light then. I could have chosen a better title here, my apology, but my intention is actually to, in, to, uh, to, in, to show the pun, like virus and fear. I like the F and F there. So uh, here also, I have no intention whatsoever to join the debate on the pros and cons of the most fatal cause of COVID-19. Um, as reported by the Washington Post, for instance, heart disease is the major driver of uh, excess death, not coronavirus. And here, to procure and analyze the data from early March to end of May, they used the model developed by the Yale School of Public Health, so uh, supposedly a very prestigious uh, research body, and uh, it's hard to really deny the, the quality of the research. Well, to compare, in Indonesia, as per today, I checked this morning, the death count, uh, the, the coronavirus hit 1,084 uh, 1, plus uh, uh, cases, then the death count is 7,700, and the recovery is quite good, that is uh, 132,000. So this is this uh, very uh, uh, alarming number, and yet we have to cope with that. COVID-19 fear is represented in the 2011 American literal movie, Contagion, about the spread of a virus transmitted by respiratory droplets, so almost similar to COVID-19. Healthcare and professional government officials and everyday people find themselves in the midst of this pandemic while trying hard to find a cure. Uh, the result is the loss of social order. As you can see here from the uh, uh, conversation, yeah, uh, depict how doctors are in conflict with each other um, they are in search of vaccine to help this spread. Here you can see from, from the, the conversation that everyone is in panic uh, mode. Uh, when we talk about illness, discipline is important. Earlier, uh, the first speaker discussed about uh, uh, the importance of uh, good living. The spread of the COVID-19 disease can be effectively controlled through human discipline. Indeed, it's not easy to remind people to wear face masks. I'm not wearing face masks right now. So uh, it's cumbersome and no comfort at all. While, while some feel that uh, staying at home is fun, others feel imprisoned and they would like to just break free and, and want to go outside the house. Yeah? Hence the transmission in, in office clusters like in schools, uh, shopping centers, 
religious or non-religious gathering, and, and, and many other crowd settings. Yeah? Uh, what I'm trying to say here is um, uh, actually is that uh, some people instill their own fear. And the call for healthy living is an exaggeration. They undermine discipline, self-control, and this is worse. They ignore the people's safety. We shall look into it later. Now, what does it have to do with literature, you might ask? You must be impatient by now, uh, because I'm blabbering about coronavirus. Uh, 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 here is another pun. That I, I really like pun. Fiction versus vaccine. Collective efforts must be made to fight against the global unprecedented health crisis. Let scientists, medical frontliners, government people, police force do their respective job, of course, uh, together with the civilians. What can language and literature students, scholars, and literature enthusiasts do? Combat the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. How? Number one, literature portrayal of pandemics deserve our attention more and more. Secondly, uh, we, we shall ask, yeah, in what ways do people throughout history experience, cope with, and defeated by illness? We have to look into it more and more. How do literary works across the globe and along different timelines depict illness and contagion? This is what we need to look at further. To mourn and to warn is the core business of literature. In what ways characters in literary works are depicted psychosocially, sociologically, yeah, uh, in, in many different facets, in many different aspects? Because literature teaches. It makes us learn to be appreciative and compassionate. I use these four salient points, uh, uh, portrayal of literature in pandemic, literature uh, function to mourn and warn, and also the, the, the effects, the real, the, 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 the tangible effects of these uh, pandemics, and then the way in which literature can teach empathy, understanding, and compassion. With the framework I've just shown you, I shall begin this exploration with two short, short, uh, two short stories yeah, known to most students of language and literature, because I use uh, these two short stories to my students in uh, English language education program. Um, uh, I think these two works are, are quite, quite uh, famous, quite, quite known to my students because of their brevity. They like reading brief. Uh, short stories, and also because they are charming and giving lasting impression. Uh, here we see the, uh, the first one, Edgar Allan Poe, is the engine behind American horror movies and the, the godfather of the modern detective stories. His short story became the inspiration for many feature films and adapted in different, um, uh, uh, different literary or cultural uh, artifacts, like even Video games, I heard that video games are based on uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's stories. I think one of his masterpieces that is resonant to the COVID-19 situation, The Mask of the Red Death. The other is a school setting story uh, written by Arthur Kavanaugh, another uh, American writer. Well, um, I think I will quickly uh, tell the story, otherwise uh, our talk will have no meaning if uh, you're not aware of the story. Uh, a bloody disease called the Red Death devastates a European kingdom. It kills a person uh, uh, rapidly by snatching the, the victim to bleed from the paws. The prince, the name is Prince Prospero, is unaffected and he believes that he can escape death. So what he do, uh, um, uh, he, uh, while other people, the peasantry are dying every day, he and his friend, the nobles, the, the rich people, gather in, in, in his own castle. He shuts himself away in his decorative castle. It has seven rooms with different colors of doors he designed himself. Uh, earlier on, uh, uh, Dr. Herujianto talked about the progression of life from the uh, Japanese uh, song. Here also the seven doors represent the progressions of life. For instance, 
Mm, blue symbolizes birth, pink symbolizes childhood, and green symbolizing um, adolescent, then orange, adulthood, and what else? Violet, violet uh, symbolizes um, imminent death, and no, no, violet, uh, uh, white first. White symbolizes uh, old time, everyone's having uh, gray hair, not white hair, and then violet, imminent death, and red death, red death. So the door painted red actually symbolizes uh, symbolizes death itself. Nobody want to enter the last room. It's black with red windows, look very frightening. Nobody dare to enter the room. Then at midnight, an uninvited guest dressed like a plague victim. So he wears a gown, very uh, scary, and enter, the, uh, enter from the very room, the room with a uh, red scarlet door. Prince Prospero approaches and unmasks the guest only to meet his death. So the, the moment he opens up uh, the rope, then death enters. Other invitees try to attack the vigor with the creepy costume, but they find nobody inside. These attackers all died on the spot. The Red Death doesn't spare anyone's, uh, anyone's life. Everyone in the party, in the very exclusive party, died. So, I'm trying to see how actually we can make some comparison and contrast between the COVID-19, the virus is unseen and even uh, you can't smell it, right? And then the mysterious figure in the red death costume. Uh, uh, it's the same, you can't see uh, when people see it's a figure, but inside it's nobody, inside it's none. It's just a uh, uh, walking, uh, walking outfit. And then uh, self-quarantine that is uh, um, uh, of, um, uh, um, called for to us, or, or uh, isolation, yeah, is the same or is uh, similar to Prospero's isolation in his castle. And then also the mask wearing for protection, I, I take off for the moment. And then uh, mask party to avoid recognition. So everyone in the party have to wear masks so that you don't know who the person uh, behind the mask. And then also the speedy spread via droplet is the same as the way um, death sees everyone uh, in, in the kingdom of Prince Prospero. Um, what can Edgar Allan Poe's short story teach us about wearing masks then? Uh, the mask does not avert the plague. Instead, it concealed it. In the case of Prince Prospero, right? Today, we must wear masks because we don't want to transmit the disease to others. Just as we don't want others to do, uh, just as uh, we don't want others to do it for us. We have to, uh, to protect ourselves in order that we don't affect anybody else. Wearing masks is not only an act of solidarity, but it is uh, an act of uh, compassion. I quote from, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, editor of uh, America, the, the, my, uh, uh, the bulletin that I, I really like very much, uh, the Jesuit Review. Father James Martin said, do you really want to help save lives? Then if you are pro-life, then start to bother, wear a mask, for instance. Yeah? Because people are very ignorant, people are, are very stubborn, they are not wearing masks, feeling that they are healthy, for instance. <laughs> Um, now I think we move on to the second story, uh, uh, Miss Awful, because we would like to see the parallel later on. Miss Awful is a nickname given by Roger. Roger is the naughtiest uh, third grade student of St. George, and, um, and um, uh, the, he, he gave the name to Miss Orville, actually it's Orville, O-R-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but Roger called her, uh, call her Awful. Roger has a spelling weakness because he doesn't spell very well. Uh, Miss Awful, unlike Miss Wilson, that is the teacher being substituted, is very disciplined. And she wants everything in order, including the teaching and learning process. Everyone has to sit in a row. Everyone uh, has to be in line. And everyone has to sit still. Yeah? Uh, unlike Miss, Hills, Miss Wilson, who usually let the student um, uh, lay on the floor, some, some even go and then step on the decks. Yeah? Uh, Miss Wilson is quite liberal. Miss Awful here is really awful in the eyes of the, the non-teacher students or pupils. The student hate Miss Awful for, he, he sometimes often confiscate, 
um, student stuff. Uh, students are playing with gadget or with other toys, and when Miss Awful saw them, then he, uh, she, she took the, the 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 toys and keep the toys so that students really focus on their study. Her way of teaching causes some parents to gossip when uh, um, um, they didn't like the way. Miss Awful, for instance, reprimand one of the parents saying that, oh, your daughter doesn't spell very well, uh, your son cannot write, uh, cannot write properly. And she told the parents on the face, and that's the thing that parents don't like. Then, um, therefore, the students would like to have a plan. Let's take revenge to this Miss Awful. They destroy Miss Awful's spotted plan. She really loves plants, and in fact, she had a very bad experience. In the past, she used to be kicked out from her apartment, and she took with her everything, including the potted plant, that now she put in the class so that the class look green, look nice, like the, uh, uh, here, yeah? And then the students, the end of the, the class session with her, then destroy the plant. The teacher tell the students to, uh, in fact, they should not do that. He said, you should take the advantage of being able to go to school and not to, uh, 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 not to do something bad at, uh, in class like that. So at her last day of the class, there is no forming lines, nothing, so students can go the way they want, yeah, because this is the last day of Miss Awful. Some students are happy, some become regretful. Rogers, the notice boy, stay behind, and Miss uh, um, Awful thought that, she would li that he would like to take back the toy, but no, uh, uh, he come up and say, R-O-G-R-R. -R -R. Now he can spell. This is very touching. Now he can spell uh, because of uh, the teaching of Miss Orful. So nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with COVID-19. You can see, but now I'll show you the parallel. Um, many many uh, critics usually uh, uh, tell us that the theme of the story is don't judge the book by its cover. It's the theme that most readers assign to the story. I think I will take a rather different uh, uh, direction here. This is because of the seminar. To me, this is a story about the importance of being well organized, yeah? uh, uh, being being orderly. Yes, the substitute teacher is misunderstood. Uh, it is only later that everyone realizes that she teaches them good manners. The teacher they hate most has taught them to become good citizen. I believe we can now see the similarity. Yeah? The, the COVID-19 pandemic has afflicted all nations across the globe with alarming death tolls every day to say nothing of its economic and socio-political impact. It happens partly because we lack disciplines. People ignore the COVID-19 protocol at will, for instance. So you can see now the, the, the parallel yeah? between the misbehaved class and the society at large who ignore protocol. Well, literature is imagination, so I, I make up that one also, yeah? Uh, so you can see the parallel. <laughs> yes. Uh, for me, the short story also gave us an important message about environmental protection. It is symbolized by the, plotted, uh, the, the potted plants that Ms. Will, um, Ms. Orwell uh, brings her, with her in her class. Ms. Orwell doesn't also say that kids are like plants to be grown. They have to be grown, nurtured, and taken care for. Uh, Pope Francis says God is good. He forgives. He forgives human beings with all the wrongdoing of us. But nature cannot forget. The, the, the nature cannot forget when it gets hurt. Nature, nature doesn't forgive, but, but, but God forgives. Right? Uh, that's the word. Uh, in sum, number one, we feel sorry for Prince Prospero in uh, uh, Poe's uh, fiction. He is a selfish authority who cares only for himself, not his folk. He thinks only of his close, rich friends to accompany him during the party and also during his isolation, in fact. Yeah? We don't feel sorry for him. But through the story, we have the understanding that in time of crisis, there might be a prospero within us. We tend to protect ourselves, right? 
And uh, secondly, this is the second conclusion, Ms. Alfel teaches us the student to love discipline, self-regulation, and also respect, orderliness, and so on, and also love to nature. Roger shows his compassion once he knows that she, at one point in her life, uh, got a, a problem with uh, her environment, for instance. So uh, with that question, can literature curb COVID-19? Uh, Paoda said that when, he, when Paoda read The Arabian Night, he liked the last part where actually no battle occur, everyone is in peace. It means that literature really transforms. So my definite answer is yes. It navigates our imagination to say the least. Yeah? Literature makes us remember that we are human beings, that we can remember our humanity. Um, I leave you with the words of Anthony de Mello, he's another Jesuit priest and psychotherapist, very controversial though, who teaches us about awareness prayer through storytelling. Once again, storytelling. Indeed, story heals. With that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ibu Novi. Let's give a big applause. All right, I remember um, a quote I just got earlier from a physicist, Mary Curie. He, she said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. And now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So basically, it's what you have been telling us for the last 20 minutes, Ibu. So thank you so much. And um, also in regard to that, to that um, one friend of mine uh, once said that, you know, those who read are happier people. Why? Because through literature, we are trained to be more empathetic. We are more trained to become compassionate, just like what Bunofi just mentioned. And once we have empathy, we will be happy to help each other. So your presentation is like the conclusion of everything, right? Thank you once again, Bunofi. So now we are moving on to the question and answer session. I already have um, four questions, but I'm going to read the first three questions, um, which were already posted in Zoom and also in YouTube. So I'm going to read the questions uh, to the panelists, to the speakers. The first question is from YouTube, and it's written by uh, Pak Marcus Budiraharjo, although you're here, Pak Marcus, but I'm just going to read your um, questions to make it more effective. Yeah. So the question is for Pak Tatang and Ibu Nofi. The question is, it is undeniable that information technology gets indispensable, especially given the unprecedented impacts of today's pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, the question is, what have you done to embrace informational technology? That's the first question for Ibu Nofi and Pak Tatang. The second question is from Zoom uh, chat room. It's from Sudar Ita Farida from Unair. And the question is for Pak Tatang again. The question is, the lyrical speakers in the two poems have created ways to cope with their difficult situation. Could you suggest some creative innovations to cope with the pandemic situation? And the third question is from Pak Joko Marihandon, sorry, Marihandonoto from Jakarta, and the question is referred to Pak Heru. So the question is, how does the Japanese philosophy inspire the Japanese culture in general, and especially in the era of the coronavirus? All right, Pak Tatang, Munofi, Pak Heru, the floor is yours. Who would like to answer first, Pak Tatang? Yes, thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I have questions from Ibu Ita Farida from the Faculty of Humanities. I'd like to read once again the questions, yeah. Um, the lyrical speakers in the two poems have created ways to cope with their difficult situations. Uh, could you suggest some creative innovations to cope with the pandemic situations? Thank you very much, yeah. It's, it's uh, interesting and difficult questions, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will also answer Pak Marco's questions with this uh, statement. Yeah. 
uh, from my presentations, uh, I take the disabled people, yeah? a group of people in which they are placed in a such situations that they have to adapt uh, a strange environment, uh, not normal situations and also uh, circumstance. Yeah. Uh, that's why I have to learn from, from this group of people. And I find three things yeah, when we face this kind of pandemic. The first one is responsive attitude. Uh, we have to make a decisions that we have to do something because of this pandemic. Uh, we cannot just stay uh, uh, calm and then do nothing. Yeah? We don't have to do that. And the, the second one is, this is a kind of the nature of human being, adaptation. We have to adapt to new environment. We have to adapt to uh, new circumstances. Changes has to be done. Yeah, we have to have such attitudes. And then uh, adaptations will give something like a, a chance. Difficult problems will give us opportunity, actually. So we, we do not perceive from the negative uh, point of view, but from the positive point of view. Change, adaptation, this is the nature of human being. Uh, when uh, the blind man cannot see the world, they have to adapt this kind of situations. They have to use the stick, they have to use the braille letters. Yeah. When the deaf cannot communicate with other people, they have to use sign language. They have to speak, uh, try to memorize the, the motion of the lips of other people. When campus is locked down, I think we have to do something. I think it's the time for us to, to, to adapt to new situations. Yeah. We don't have to grumble. We, we don't have to be angry with ourselves. Oh, uh, uh, we have to complain to each other. Yeah. Okay, so the key to the creative innovation is actually and that this, is, this should be considered as an opportunity to change. Time to adapt to new situations. This is the nature of human being, adaptations. Uh, I have a story, it's very interesting. I like cycling. Saya suka ngowes. When we have the pandemic, uh, people are afraid of outing. Yeah. People avoid uh, taking journey or traveling with uh, airplane, buses, or trains. Yeah. And people are afraid of running some business. Yeah, yeah and then uh, after two or three months, uh, uh, we are what we call bored, staying at home. And then we, we have to go out uh, doing some exercises. And I take cycling, and I saw something like innovative uh, or creative innovations. Yeah. Uh, the hotel was closed, but they provide something like a, a breakfast with a special reasonable price for, for the bikers. Yeah. So this challenge, this, this uh, what we call these problems, actually become the opportunity. Yeah, become the chance to have a, a new life. Yeah. So uh, take this problem as a chance, opportunity, like uh, the disabled people. Uh, take responsive attitude. We have to make a decision that we have to move uh, from the previous situations to new uh, uh, circumstances. Yeah. And for Pak Marcos, I think uh, my answer is the same. Yeah, uh, what have you done to embrace uh, IT? Yeah, actually, I'm not 
family with IT much. Yeah, I'm from the faculty of letters. Yeah, uh, people say that students or lecturers from faculty of letters itu buta angka, buta teknologi. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this is a kind of challenge. This is a kind of uh, new adaptations. I have to. I must. Yeah. So we have to put aside. Uh, yeah, unwillingness, uh, we have to put aside, uh, what is it, uh, uh, frustrations and so on. Yeah, we have to move on yeah, to new situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Tata. Next one, Ibu Novi. Uh, thank you. I think I say amen to all that, Pak Tata, yeah? uh, because in this situation, uh, we, we shall not uh, uh, instill fear, we, we should have hope, and, and hope is uh, very important at this moment because uh, only then that will life goes on. And for me, because I'm uh, doing, uh, uh, I'm teaching literature classes, uh, uh, the hope is I can still sell ideas uh, through stories that, that, that will make students happy and hopeful and more optimistic. And as we can see from Bu Truly's presentation, um, uh, PBE students, for instance, they are really w very, very, uh, <clears throat> um, they are great. They show compassion. I, I feel touched because of that, because they know that uh, all lecturers are struggling also with that. And they also know that many lecturers are not really tech savvy, me being the example, and they are compassionate and they understand that we have difficulty in running the program, and, but we are all learning, and, and it's a learning uh, curve for lecturers, but for students, they also feel happy because they can help lecturers. The opportunity to make them feel someone, I think that is very important. So it's not all black, uh, it's not all red, uh, red door. We enter the more cheerful and colorful because uh, yes, everyone is impacted, but it is the way who, we face that, how we deal with that. And yes, I, I will continue selling stories to, to, to students because uh, with that, then I think uh, they will be more optimistic and hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Novi. Right, the next question, Pak Heru, would you care to answer it, please? Right, okay, uh, the question from Professor uh, Joko Marihandono from uh, Indonesian University. Okay, <laughs> hello Pak Joko. Right, okay, uh, in fact, okay, we, we, we know ourselves that everything, okay, for Javanese people can become a philosophy. Everything at all, yeah, everything at all. <laughs> okay, uh, that's why we have the so-called ilmu titan, yeah, ilmu titan. This is only from repeating thing what is uh, taking place, and then they find a theory. Okay, all right. If somebody uh, is thinking hard. Okay, they find out that they will, okay, uh, point their forehead like that, okay. Oh, he must think, okay. If somebody put on their nose, oh no, he's not thinking, <laughs> for example. Okay, that's a kind of ilmutitan, yeah. Okay, and then also, uh, you can find it in Katasunanism so theory, for example, the word sita eding. Sita eding, how do you say sita eding in English? win-win solution, okay. So based on such an expression, there are so many uh, works, yeah, okay. Be it popular uh, lit, pop lit, or even uh, good literary work produced. Okay, like, uh, okay, I think I already mentioned it, uh, but I could not elaborate it uh, due to uh, the time. I think in slide uh, 
12, yes, yeah, slide 12. Okay, uh, let me see, I'll show you very quickly. Okay. Right here. Okay, slide 12. There. Okay, uh, it is uh, written. Okay, it is, uh, it is written by uh, Ki Bab Babdu Langit. Ki Babdu Langit, yeah. Okay, uh, there, yeah. Uh, Ki Dung Wingit. Okay, take a look at the, the, the work, the Guguritan, the, the poem. Okay, Ki Dung Tanggap Pagabluk. Okay, yeah. Okay, he said ono kitung remekso ing wengi. Ya. Teguh hayu luputing loro. Oke. Okay. Right. Oke. Okay. This is a response, ya. Yeah. A response to it. Oke, okay. and this a key sabdo langit uh, just keep silent, oke, okay. and he start writing ono kitung remekso ing wengi. Okay, so wangi means ratri, means night. Okay, okay, gunaning wong luput. Okay, guna guna yang dikirim seseorang. Okay, so the so called ah uh, what do you call it a uh, thread, yeah thread. Okay, uh, okay, which is okay uh, uh, produced by somebody to attack you. Okay, won't mean anything. Okay, in, in other words, okay, the content, okay, of the work is like, okay, uh, the definition of literature itself, it is portraying reality of life. So what is being experienced, then it is uh, portray, okay, their feeling restlessness, okay, of the pandemic, for example, Yeah, it is expressed, okay, through their words, and, and they consider it as a warning, a warning, as a guideline, okay, as I mentioned earlier, for example, when the work is produced, okay, uh, it is not meant that they do not do anything, no, this is only one step, then the second step is to conduct laku, Right? Okay, I got a letter from Robert from France saying, uh, quoting from, from a report from BBC, yeah? Okay, the report is written by, okay, not Indonesian reporter. Okay, I know, I know him, yeah? Uh, okay, the article, the report says that some people in certain villages in Indonesia, they are facing, okay, the COVID-19, by just praying, okay? okay, and believe that God will prevent them from being infected by the virus, just that. So the report is only talking about the surface, not into the deeper one. That's why earlier I said, it is not easy to understand text, especially, if it is from different cultural background. Okay. Uh, okay, such a report, and it is published in the BBC that uh, Indonesian people do not do anything but just, just pray, saying prayer. And then they believe that they will not be infected by the virus. That's only the surface, okay. They do not understand that the prayer, that the literary work, this is only the first step. Okay, okay, because the most important thing, especially in Java, is laku, yeah, the action. Okay, not the word, but the act. Okay, after having, after having the literary work as a guideline, then, okay, they take the second step. Okay, for example, they dream to, to, what you call it, to embrace Manunggaling Kawulo Gusti. It means they are trying to return to the source. Okay, in order to do so, they will 
say something good, they will conduct something good, they will stay clean, etc. and so on. Okay, and how to do that? Okay, you know the three steps that we have been uh, exposed, yeah? Okay, wearing masks, okay, okay, uh, distancing, and then of course stay clean. Okay, Pak uh, Joko. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think, I think that's, yeah. Okay, thank you, Pak Heru. All right, now we move on to the next session um, of the Q&A. Uh, the, the questions are piling up, so you don't need to worry for not having any questions, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the next part of the uh, Q&A section is, um, there is one question from Zoom. It's from Hope Anton. I'm sorry, I hope I spell your name correctly. Um, from the United Board of Christian Higher Education in Asia, Hong Kong. The question is for all of the speakers, yeah, for all the four of you. The question is, what is your most important takeaway for this pandemic that will impact higher education, even into post-COVID situation? Thanks a lot. And the second question is from YouTube, from UD, uh, and the affiliation is from Rumah Sakit Cipto Mangun Kusumo, Jakarta. And the question is also for all of the speakers. What are the challenges in linguistic sector to reach out our various communities to educate people about COVID-19? And the next question is for Ibu Truli Almendo. Uh, this is a question from Zoom a participant named Kristi Nawati from Faculty of Humanities, Unair. And the question is, how can we enhance students to have great spirit in learning during this pandemic? Okay, who would like to answer the question first? Butruli, would you like to start? Thank you very much, Bumita. I would like to answer a very interesting question from Pak Yudi on YouTube, right? Okay, so how can we, what is that, act through linguistics during this pandemic? Well, I guess people nowadays are exposed with much information, news, as well as false news, right? We need to combat those false news by using language to spread good messages, to spread message of hope, like what Bunofi mentioned. And we can do that by analyzing the functions of using language. Why do I say this? Why do I state this? Yeah. So we can start spreading good messages, message of hope through our use of language. And I would like to add, I think this is related to pa Marcos' questions previously. So we can also embrace IT uh, through the use, through hope, yeah? Uh, so I have this uh, acronym HOPE, H stands for humanizing people behind the gadgets, yeah? And O is for being open for the situations that we need to use IT. P, being positive in a new situation, facing new normal. And E, engage in the tools that we use in the learning process. And I would like to answer the question uh, very interesting, very relevant questions from Bu Christina Wati about motivating our students. I think this question is very relevant to all educators, even parents at home, yeah, because uh, we become teachers and we need to use technology in order to deliver materials to facilitate engagement and to give feedback as well. Yeah, So I think... Um, my answer can be different from other lecturers' answer. So I just would like to share my experience. So I think uh, 
I want to facilitate more interactions, yeah? peer interactions, student-teachers interactions. Yeah? So I think interactions during online learning uh, are very important. That's also seen in students' reflections. They miss interactions. Yeah? They, they crave for social interactions. Yeah? And we need also to facilitate engagement, um, create, relate, and donate. So we can ask them to create things using technology. And they can also relate um, the learning materials with, the, with, with their surroundings through reflections. Yeah? I have mentioned in the presentations that writing re reflection can offer benefits. Yeah? And donate by allowing them to share through technology, through social media, and so on. So uh, the last thing is to be flexible, yeah, because yeah, we need to think about the people behind the gadget, yeah. So uh, I think we need to be flexible as well. So I think uh, that's my uh, elaboration, Buno, Bumita. Thank you, Ibu Truli. Okay, Bu Novi, Pak Heru, Pak Tatang, who would like to answer? Okay, Pak Tatang. Okay. Uh, Two participants ask me questions here. And the first one is from Pak Sarwoto. This is also for Punovi and Pak Heru. Some people argue that the severity of COVID-19 and efforts to contain the pandemic are partly constructed for political and economical benefits. This is very interesting. <laughs> what do you think of this claim? Yeah. OK. Uh, this pandemic is fact. This pandemic is real, and it happens to our life, and it impacts our life in every element of, uh, of life also. But sometimes, uh, yeah, there are two, two group of people uh, usually are very clever in using or manipulating the situations. We have problems when the first time we are faced with this pandemic. The first one is the, uh, it's difficult for us to find, for example, like vitamin, hand sanitizers, yeah? and, and mask also. I think uh, this kind of uh, chaos will be treated uh, economically by a group of people. And then also uh, uh, for politicians, sometimes it can be used to tackle the, the governments. For example, like uh, we have to spread, uh, so some people spread the, the, the bad news of the collapse of the, the government, for example, or economic crisis. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the situation, this kind of situation is easily used to, to gain benefits. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, from Pak Daniel Widyatama from Universitas Mercubuana. Uh, thanks for sharing the great, two great poems. Pak, really hard touching. Syukurlah kalau touching ya. Teachers and students often feel hopeless during this pandemic time. How do you see then importance of poems and any literary work to express feelings and emotion and what could be the positive impacts of poems and to cue students and teachers frustration do you have any thoughts about that yeah of course as i said again and again and again that problems of this pandemic becomes the opportunity pandemic becomes the chance good chance for us to move on to find something new uh, students can be uh, assigned to write, to reflect what, what, what they experience about this pandemic. And it can be a, a poem, it can be a short story. Uh, this is what I did when I did uh, writing in Sastra Indonesia and also Western Civilization in, in Sastra Inggris. So I think uh, 
literature is not only knowledge. Yeah, it's not. It's not about uh, a plot, characters, uh, conflict. No, but it's also a reflection of life. So I think um, this pandemic uh, enabled us to 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 show our capability in in reflecting the the situations. Thank you very much, Bumita. Okay. Thank you, Pak Tatang. And uh, Bunofi, Pak Heru, what is your take on uh, Hope Anton's question? What is your most important takeaway from this pandemic that will impact higher education even in the post-pandemic? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Hope, for the, the question. And I think uh, for me personally is a, a little ICT enhancement skill. That is the takeaway. And, and this is the time when uh, actually, we can disprove the idea that the teacher is all powerful. Actually, students are better in terms of ICT skills, and we can learn from the students. And I'm surprised that they are really very sympathetic, knowing that uh, the the lecturers are are not able to operate the uh, gadget and students help. And such collaboration will never happen had everything been normal. So this one, I think, is the takeaway. And um, like other speakers, yeah, Pak Tatang and also Pak Heru and Putruli, that we then can make use of the time to um, to read a lot uh, more and more uh, good news, yeah, uh, uh, not to deal with uh, hoax and yeah uh, and and other things that just uh, become a, a, a like a poison our mind. We have to be more open with uh, other people's idea. Maybe they are different from us, but with simple, uh, sympathy and understanding, well, we are different, but let me, let me do this thing, let me do my way, because uh, in fact, uh, we shall not judge other people in order to, uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, if you want, you see that everyone is not clean, but you have to come come out clean yourself before you can actually see that other people are not clean. So I think uh, uh, I will use this opportunity to reflect more and more, and and yes, uh, uh, being hopeful, like uh, that is uh, like yourself, yeah. Hope your name also instill some hope in my heart, yeah. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Bunovi. Pak Heru. Okay. Um, hello, Hope. Anthony. Okay. Hello, Hong Kong. Um, I agree with Pa Tatang and Bunovi. Yeah, but I would like to add just one single thing that I particularly uh, concerned with due to this uh, COVID. Uh, number one, because it never happened before. Okay, during our beginning of the semester, okay, I was so surprised that so many students, okay, they are very active contacting the lecturers. It never happened before. Okay, and not only that, okay, uh, they are also willing to know what is the outcome of the class. Okay. I would like to just say one word. One of the benefit of uh, experiencing uh, this infectious era that many of my students they are becoming more independent. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Heru. Yes, Butruli, would you like to add something? I would like to answer Pak Daniel's question. Is it sure, okay? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, hello, Pak Daniel. Maybe you are watching now. So Pak Daniel is my friend. He is an expert in technology, actually. Yeah. So uh, his question is: um, Would you suggest any strategies or low tech? Applications that teachers or lecturers could use in order to assess students' learning from distance, which they will find it accessible. Well, thank you very much for the questions, Pak Daniel. I think it's also very relevant for us as lecturers and teachers. Well, I think assessment is an essential and a very important part of learning. Also, when we have this online learning uh, assessment, help us measure how the students have achieved 
the learning objectives, right? And there are many applications actually that we can use to give feedback. In my experience, I would like to share my experience in using Belajar USD, ACID. I've, I can make rubrics to make my assessment fast and also effective. So um, we can create rubrics, online rubrics from Moodle. I think uh, it's going to be very easy to use, yeah. So we can try using online rubrics. For formative assessment, I find it enjoyable to use quizzes to give formative assessment to students, formative tests to students. So the students would get quick and uh, direct feedback. So I think, yes, assessment is very important, uh, especially during online learning, because our students without face-to-face -face supervision needs to know whether they are going in the right direction or not. So I think it is a high time to adapt technology, to explore technology to help us assess our students better. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ibu Truli. Let's go to the previous question that I um, read earlier. It's from uh, UDRS, uh, from UD. It's from YouTube. It's from Rumah Sakit Cipto Mangan Kusuma. And this is for all of the speakers. Uh, what are the challenges in linguistic sector in reaching out various communities to educate them about COVID-19? Your responses, please. Bunofi first. Okay, or Butruli for the linguistic okay, sector. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned before, yeah, oh, during this pandemic, we are bombarded with information, news, even false news. And how do we combat this false news? Um, we can do that by spreading good messages, messages of hopes. We can be more aware of uh, linguistic features that can help us spread good messages, messages that make, that improve our immunity in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Pak Tatang, would you like to share your opinions on this? Uh, Although it's a bit well, far away from literature, but yeah. maybe it's more on um, the challenges in giving the information. So maybe if you can see it from the literature point of view, will that be a big challenge for us to share or to educate people? Maybe Pak Heru? All right, okay, I mentioned just a little bit. Okay, uh, with uh, this uh, pandemic, okay, I would like to ask, okay, especially in Indonesia, why they are using the word pandemic instead of wabah, for example? Yeah, or maybe using pagblok, okay, but why pandemic? Okay, unless, okay, also the terms new, new normal. That's also linguistic problems, yeah, that people can ending up with misunderstanding. Okay, okay, instead of saying that we have to do something new, instead of the word new normal. Okay, so such, such terms, yeah, I think some, uh, okay, the government, the management in, in the government, I think they need some people who are good in language. And this, I think. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else would like to add? Pak Tatang or Budruli? Okay, all right. Okay, um, so we still have a, a couple of minutes to go. There is uh, another question from YouTube uh, from Indiwara Pandu. It's from Sanatan Dharma. And the question is for Pak Tatang. Um, how literature transfers what is depicted in the poems into real action so that the students can make a better change? Uh, once again, please. How? How can, uh, how literature transfers what is depicted in the poems into real action mm. so that students can make a better change? Yeah, okay. 
Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. It's a difficult question to answer, yeah? <laughs> right. Uh, actually, literature is written uh, with a purpose, yeah? Uh, some people maybe uh, like what Pak Heru says, uh, to entertain, uh, to be useful, and also, this is a kind of uh, uh, beautiful writing, yeah? and also a uh, kind of uh, uh, a real life uh, documents of behavior expressed with imaginations and also with what we call uh, a certain language. Uh, it can be figurative language or other language styles. Yeah. But the most important thing is that this is the experience of what human feels, what human expects, what human face, what human encounters in their life. So uh, yes, we learned uh, the physical uh, element of the poetry, like the uh, rhyme, uh, and then uh, uh, the stanza, and also the message, and so on. So, yeah. But the most important thing is actually this is a, a talk human of behavior. Yeah. That's, that's what we have to deal with actually for the students. Yeah. What the, the authors experience in a certain time, in a certain time, in a certain situations. I think uh, it, it's kind of history that we can learn from. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pak Datang. Um, I would like to invite all of the speakers to give like a closing remarks about this, so is there any um, comments or any other suggestions or just what would you like to say to our audience here in the room and also in Zoom and YouTube? Each of you, you have like one minute or two. Bahiri, would you? Thank you. Right, uh, less than one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everything taking place in this world Okay, sometimes we cannot uh, avoid it. Okay, but if we keep on having this called love, trust no, then everything will be okay. So my, my saying is, all we need is love. All you need is love. It's like, is that a Beatles, right? A song from Beatles. Thank you. All you need is love. Thank you so much, Pak Heru. The next one, uh, Bunofi. Um, I've shown it in my last slide that we uh, should, uh, should say goodbye to uh, uh, COVID-19 and welcome compassion. So that is my uh, uh, last word for last, several words, yeah? <laughs> just one word, yeah. Uh, yeah, just that, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Wu Novi. Wu Truly? Thank you, Bumita. So, language reflects our mind as well as our surroundings. And instead of spreading message of fear, let's turn the messages into messages of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Wu Truly, message of hope. The last but not least, Pak Tatang. Yeah, uh, we can learn much from the text of literature, uh, especially from a group of people uh, who are marginalized. And fortunately, we can learn from that. Yeah. During this pandemic, I think we can uh, gain something valuable from these two poems, yeah, or generally from literatures. Uh, we can learn that we have to be have what we call responsive attitude. The decision must be made to face this new environment. And then we have to, oh, as a human being, this is natural, we have to adapt to a new situation. Adaptation is, is, uh, is uh, uh, natural for human being. And then uh, this challenge uh, enable us to, to what we call uh, have a uh, creative innovations. I think literatures uh, will contribute it uh, to this uh, pandemic. Thank you.
Thank you, Pat Datang. Okay, everyone, please give a round of big applause to all of the presenters. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so the question and answer session should be ended uh, in a few moments, in a few minutes, right? So um, I'm going to share to you or say thank you on behalf of the comedy for all of the positive reviews from Zoom, from YouTube. Um, you have made this a wonderful occasion for everyone of us here. And thank you so much for the support. I cannot mention it one by one because there are so many of you who have written thank you and appreciating all of the things that we have been doing for the past three hours. So from the bottom of our hearts, I would like to say thank you to everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching the end of the webinar. I'm going to close this webinar or the uh, presentation session with a quote from Maya Angelou. And I'm sure you're familiar with Maya Angelou. Uh, she is a well-respected uh, author and a prominent author. She said, you may not control all of the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. So it's a very close, uh, close and dear to our hearts today, right? So we did just that. We learned to understand the new dynamics in our society. The more we learn, the more we understand. When we understand our condition, we will have the ability to cope and adapt with the new situation. We will be more empathetic and we will be more compassionate to other beings. Thank you very much for your participation. The, I'll give back to you. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found the presentations informative and useful. Thank you to the speakers for delivering the presentation and also to the moderator who leads the seminar. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, before we finally close this event, there are several announcements which I would like to inform you. The lucky participants who get the book as a door prize are Sudar Ida Ita Farida from Erlangga University, Surabaya, Joko Marihandono from Jakarta, Yudi from Rumah Sakit Cipto Mangun Kusumo, Jakarta, Kristina Wati from Faculty of Humanities, Erlangga University, Surabaya, and Daniel Widyatama from Pendidikan Bahasa Inggris Universitas Mercu Buana, Yogyakarta. For the participant who get the door prize, please contact us through email lemlit at usd.ac.id. Congratulations for getting the door prize. For the participants, who needs an electronic certificate, please fill survey form with the link address in the description part at YouTube Humas USD. Please note that the deadline of the survey completion and e-certificate request is Friday for September 2020 at 4 p.m. Indonesian Western Time or at 11 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. Thank you to Canisius Publisher, which support this webinar. The speaker's presentation can be downloaded from the link in YouTube Humas USD. Now, let us close this seminar with prayer of gratitude. I will lead the prayer in Catholic way. Participants are also welcome to pray in accordance with their faith or religions. In the name of the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for a successful seminar. We know that you have blessed us, hence this success. Thank you, Lord, for the technology which makes this seminar is possible 
for the participants to join online. Thank you for the spirit and the hope for us to amidst for us amidst the pandemic so that we always have a positive energy to share. May you keep blessing us as we go out of this venue and apply what we have learned from this webinar in our, our own profession. Grant that we do this fully aware that it is not for ourselves that we learn, but for the service of other people. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in the name of the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Excellences, participants, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in webinar Sanata Dharma Sharing Amidst a Pandemic with the theme, Coping with Coronavirus Through Language and Literature. We hope that this event has brought new insights amidst the pandemic. Thank you for spending time with us today.